Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DevOps track. Uh, for this talk, please welcome Matt Tesaro and Aaron Weaver, with, who will be with us shortly, uh, for the talk of making continuous security a reality with OWASP AppSec pipeline. So, hello. Um, yeah, Aaron is having uh, tube issues, so he told me he should be able to make it. I just quickly rearranged the deck because it was supposed to be me, him, me, and now it's me, 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 him. So, yeah, it's all good. We're giving him the most amount of time to get here on time. If he doesn't make it, I can cover his bit, but I'd like him to cover his bit because it's good and it's his. All right, so let's get going. So, making continuous security a reality. I'm me, I'm Matt Tassaro. I really think AppSec needs to change. I'm gonna give you one of my ways I think it needs to change, my opinion on that. Uh, if you need to reach me, I'm at Matt Tassaro or Matt Tassaro at OS.org. I'm also uh, uh, one of the few, the six uh, FTEs at OWASP, full-time employees. Aaron Weaver, who will be here shortly, very nice fellow. He's trying to make AppSec a little bit better every day. He's a principal security engineer at 10 Security. Um, and there is his contact information. We have this, I think, on the last slide as well. And the deck will be presented and this is being recorded, so we're all good. So quick survey, raise your hands if you do AppSec, product security, Security engineer, DevOps, DevSecOps, Sec, DevOps, Ops, Dev, Tech, Sec, DevOps, Ops, Dev, DevOps, Sec, Sec, Sec. Okay, most everybody, good. I kind of felt the room was going to be that way, but I wanted to ask. So, this to me is how traditional AppSec tooling feels. They are not made to go fast, they are made to go slow. So, it's almost like when you're doing, running these traditional AppSec tools against your suite of applications, you are jousting with snails. And I forget who posted this on Twitter, but I loved it and I grabbed it because it totally fits this talk. And I don't like this world. I want this world to go away. I want a much faster world. So I'm in London. I'm a kind of a Shakespeare guy. I figured I had to throw in a Shakespeare quote. So I came not to praise Caesar, but to bear him. And to give it a little AppSec twist, I came not to praise traditional AppSec, I came to bury it. Right, so hopefully today I will convince you that traditional AppSec needs to go, because honestly, it's dead and buried. Right? <laughs> but by AppSec. We want to do it a different way, in a better way. And that's hopefully what I'm going to talk about today. So let's talk about an AppSec pipeline. Uh, myself and my co-presenter Aaron and I have been doing this for a while now. Um, it kind of came out of the time, or it started when I was at Rackspace. And I had been in a much more, actually, two jobs prior. I was in a very waterfall shop, so we had a testing week, and I could fit security in that QA week, and it was all kind of waterfall-y, and it was okay. And then I got to Rackspace, and it was like, we do pushes to production 75 times a week, and like, there's no testing window in that, right? So I had to rethink. And so this is the outgrowth of me radically rethinking how you do AppSec. Oh, and the purpose. The purpose of an AppSec security program, right, is to evaluate the security of the suite of apps that your company has or maybe your client if you're a, a consultant, right, and give them the status to the business, right? This is the state of the security of this app, right? And then the business can say, we're okay with this, we're not okay with this, we want to fix that, but not that, right? But at the end of the day, you're supposed to just give them a roadmap to how secure or insecure their suite of applications are, right? And so you provide them a guide for the business to make decisions, and most people have no clue about their absolute suite of apps, right? Like, who has a full entire, they're 100% confident, they bit their firstborn child on it, inventory of their apps? We got one, two, and not a lot of others. I've never been at a place where we had this, or I felt like I had this, right? It's just, there's too much going on too fast, too many little random things popping up, changing, re being renamed. So you gotta have a way to be as dynamic as your business, as an AppSec person. Right? All you need is a plan and the roadmap and the courage to press on to your destination. And hopefully the AppSec pipeline is that roadmap. So here's an AppSec pipeline. If you've ever seen one of my talks, this has been around for a while. Aaron was actually the one nice enough to create this. And the idea here is you, if you think about, we, when I was working at Pearson, we thought about like, how does, what do I have to do as an AppSec person, right? Well, I'm gonna have some sort of request or something come in, and that's intake, right? I'm gonna need to have some sort of place to keep track of those requests and what's coming in and what work needs to be done. We'll have to do some sort of triage and orchestration to decide how that work happens. Ideally, I'll have a whole bunch of tools lined up that I can automate and a la carte choose. Maybe the low risk app only gets tool one, but the high risk app gets one, two, three. Right? But it allows me to be flexible. 
And at the end, probably one of the key things is to have a vulnerability repository that is the source of truth. Um, and for the places I've worked, the kind of mantra was, if it wasn't in this thing, it doesn't exist. You can do a manual pen test and find all the cool bugs you want, but if it doesn't make it into the vulnerability repository, I don't care. You haven't done work, as far as I'm concerned, as boss man. Anyway, you have done work, but you know what I'm saying. And then from there, if you have this normalized data, you can push it into defect trackers, Jira, GitHub issues, whatever, run metrics. If you have a GRC tool that's actually installed and working, cough, cough, um, you can push it to that. Right? You can remove false positives, all that good stuff. And if you look at my past talks, I, I go on this in depth. I'm kind of flying over this for this talk because time and I have new material. <laughs> sort of the second generation of this, and, and honestly, this I should point out, this is really designed to make your internal team work well. This isn't necessarily for external teams. This is to get your house in order, right? If you get this thing going, now your team is firing on all cylinders and very productive, ideally. The next sort of iteration of that is, is like, cool, we got our stuff figured out. Let's go reach out to those teams that are doing CI, CD and start dropping in to, uh, tests that are low false positive, high confidence tests that I can now feed back into here. They'll make it to Defect Dojo. You could actually move this arrow all the way to Defect Dojo or your vulnerability repository, whatever, right? But the idea is now that I've got my workflow going insane, I can now reach out to other teams and start gathering other bits of information. Like at Pearson, well, their other team had, uh, what was it? Uh, I can't remember that. They had a, a uh, dang it. I can't remember the name of the tool. They had another tool, and it wasn't one that we purchased. And we just asked, hey, can we have access to pull that feed in? We pulled that feed in. We never ran it. We never did anything with it, but it gave us more visibility on the suite of apps. Oh, I can't remember what that thing was. So what is an AppSec pipeline? I've sort of been ranting about it for a bit. It is a way to conduct testing in an automated fashion. It's run by the AppSec team for the AppSec team. Now, obviously, these results will go to management and the dev teams, right? But it's really to make your internal team better. And it's to get your house in order and then take actionable items and hand those off to devs, right? And it's a way to scale coverage, because if you can do this automation and kind of cut the rough edges off of getting work done, you can do a lot more work. But this is not the like thorough, leet um, hacker tool. I spent six hours uh, downloading and uncompiling the binary thing. These are baseline tests, right? This is not super crazy pen testing. This is you must be this high to ride the ride. And that's OK, because we can do that across all of our apps. And then as you iterate and add more tools and tweaking, you can make that height a little bit higher and higher as you go. But it's much more about coverage. Because if I can run this tool quickly across my whole suite of apps, I at least now know the ones that are the spookiest. And maybe I spend time with some or maybe those are low risk. And this one that doesn't have that many issues is high risk and it gets more love. Right? But now I can actually make informed decisions because I have data, which is kind of a good thing. What isn't an AppSec pipeline? Right? It's not the one thing that'll fix all your problems. I'm not selling you pixie dust. There's work here. <laughs> I think it's effective work, but there's still work here. And if you think about it, a pipeline creates an artifact, right? So a CI CD pipeline is going to create a deployable uh, application, ideally a deployed application. So an AppSec pipeline, its artifacts are findings, right? At the end of the day, you run your pipeline and you have one or more findings that came out of that system that you have to now go talk with the dev teams, get them fixed, decide if it's worth fixing, et cetera. Right? Does that all make sense so far? Are we good? Awesome. Let me grab a drink. So one of the things I want to do at OWASP is set up a pipeline to actually look at our own project. So the idea here is you pull out from the, a GitHub repo. Actually, oh, I need to update this slide. This has been replaced by a much cuter thing. I'll show you that in a few slides. Dang it, I forgot to update that slide. You pull out a GitHub into some sort of a, a workflow, in this case Jenkins, although it won't be for me. Um, you launch some Dockers, right? Dockers are pre-configured with security tools, so you know how to run. Run those guys, like say for example, maybe you're running Zap Docker against a test app. Get the results, feed those into Defect Dojo, optionally shunt some things off to say a Slack channel for that project, and push the results into Jira, right? This is like another example of how you can do sort of an automated workflow to make things happen quicker. There's a whole lot of glue code and stuff that has to happen here to make this work but you only have to kind of do it once, right? I only have to make the Docker that launches Zap one time and then I can launch it against anything. And actually, uh, Simon has a good Docker anyway, so you probably don't have to do anything. 
Oh, and my call to action with my god-awful picture in a suit, one of the rare occurrences that I'm in a suit. Um, that's one of my evil times as a, as a well, not evil, but I was a, I was a uh, consultant, so they had suitified me for a while. Um, I'm really, 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 really sick of logging into 52 different web consoles and pulling out data. Like, please bug all the vendors, be nice to them, like talk to them down to the expo hall, but then say, by the way, I want to say in REST API to talk to your thing. Because honestly, I might want to log in once or twice to get a feel for it, but I want to write some code that talks to your API and I never log into that thing ever again. Done. I'm sorry? Stable REST API. Yes, yeah, stable and REST are two good um, ways or additions to that. Yes, absolutely. Because I've also had vendors say, yes, we have an API. And when I actually dig under the covers, it's used their, say, binary client. I'm like, that's not an API. That's a freaking binary client that now I have to wrap with some duct tapey thing and it was ugly. We made it work, but it's, yeah, REST API. Please bug the vendors for that. So, GASP is the Golang Application Security Pipeline, and this is probably why I shouldn't name things. Um, I made an <laughs> implementation of the AppSec pipeline, an actual concrete coded uh, implementation of the AppSec pipeline, and I had my daughter draw, this is a much cuter thing, this is much cuter than Jenkins. My daughter drew a, a Golang gopher for me, gasping, um, so that's, that's sort of the logo. Hi, Josie. Um, we have a GitHub repository at uh, GitHub, dot com slash app sec pipeline. This is the uh, specification, I'll talk you through this, where we actually have the specification, so if you wanna create your own, I sort of have the where, how, and why. Um, GASP is a library that uh, is just used by, or GASP is the library that is used by GASP Docker to actually do the pipeline stuff, and I'll, I'll speak through what that does. I just made it a library so I can include it in different things. So the specification, we have a, the, an actual written out spec that says this is what, like we define all the bits, a tool is this, a results volume is that, a target is this, and a persistent volume is that. Um, for example, a persistent volume is a volume that lives after the run is done, right? I wanna keep the data. For some of the runs I've done, I have a non-persistent volume. I create a volume, I do a bunch of runs, the tool results get written there. At the end of the run, you fire off the stuff into Defect Dojo, and blow away the, the volume, because who cares, right? I got the results, I'm done. Kind of depends what you want to do. Um, tool containers, controllers, application, this is GASP. An event is something happens that makes you want to run this pipeline, but it's, it's all spelled out in the specification. I also have a uh, sequence diagram that's checked into GitHub. This is actually really, I forget the name of the project that I used to do this, but it's actually like a markup-like code that you can do diagrams, and then run a program, and it gens this PDF, uh, ping for you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I love that thing. Um, but we have a, if you want to know how it works, this is how GASP works. Um, here's an example of an implementation I did with GASP, where I had some sort of event happen. I get a web hook from, um, I get a web hook from GitHub. I have just a, you know, we have a new uh, engagement to go look at this app, whatever it is. That event happens. The AppSec pipeline, in my case, GASP, is notified by the event, it launches a bunch of containers, one or more containers. The way GASP works, and I'll show you some examples of this, you can set one or more containers in a sequence. There's a uh, initial, a pipe, what we call a setup, a pipeline, and then a final, so you can actually have them in sequenced in three separate stages, almost like if you've ever done Debian packaging, like pre-install and install and post-install. Um, and then all the containers run, those results are sent back to the pipeline and dropped into Defect Dojo, done. Uh, when I did this using AWS, we were able to do 36 GitHub, I had a list of 36 GitHub repo URLs, and I ran all of those and it took just over three minutes to do, these were Python and it was running, um, I was get cloning them, um, running Bandit against them, and then piping the results to Defect Dojo, and that was three minutes. It was crazy fast, I was pleasantly surprised. I knew it was gonna be fast, but I didn't actually think it was gonna be that fast. So, making containers work for you. One of the key things about making this pipeline really work, and there's a whole bunch of Docker files up in that repo, um, is to cre just create those containers like big executables, right? That Docker is just like, you run Nmap, you just type you know, Nmap, blah, 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 options, and hit go, and you're done, right? You don't actually mess with Nmap internally. 
Once you get that container set up, it's just like a binary. You send some results to it, they run, they produce a result, and then you're, you throw away that, that container. None of these things run longer than it takes to run the tool, and then you just trash them. Um, and then you think of each tool, as, each tool or, or service as a container, and you can if you want to, and we've done this, I don't give them away because you need a license, but like for commercial tools, you can write a shim in that container that knows how to talk to that commercial tool and run it for you, right? So you can basically put a shim in a Docker that can call out to the commercial tool and say run check marks or fortify or whatever, right? And then push those results back into Defect Dojo. We have configuration in YAML, and the YAML contains pre-configured profiles for the tools. The other nice thing here is we set two or three sort of canned profiles with saying defaults. So you, out of the box, you can just sort of run this and you get reasonable results. If you're really worried about accuracy or once you've done this a couple of times and you want to kind of really ratchet up the accuracy, you can tweak and override those profiles, but we wanted to give you sort of an easy button where you can just run the thing out the door and done. So here's an example of uh, what's what we call the secpipeline config.yaml, and this is just a listing of the tool. So up here, right, we have Bandit, it's static code analyzer, here's a description, here's a couple of URLs. Importantly, here's the Docker, right, that we're gonna launch, we version them. Um, the parameters you can send into this is a LOC, which is the location of the code, right, so you can, wherever you're dropping that into your container, that's your uh, location of source code. Um, here's the commands, right, I'm gonna exec Bandit, it's in a shell, here's how I produce a report, Here's the report name. These squiggly braced variables are replaced at runtime. Um, post, I can do some post processing. So this actually parses out the bandit um, report name and parses it into a friendly format for Dojo. And if you want to do stuff, Aaron does this. I don't, to be honest. He also does JUnit to run some JUnit output against it as well, right? That's one example. All these are up in the repo too as well. And for Git, here's an exa another example for Git. Right, this is git, there's the, the docker. Um, you can put in a git URL, a location, and you can also pull tags. So if I wanna pull just a URL or a specific tag in git, it's all there, it'll execute this little shim to run git and done. So if I wanna run git against something on public GitHub, I drop a public GitHub on the end of this call to this docker and it gets pulled down to the, uh, by default it's opt appsec pipeline slash source and done. Nice, super way to automate. Um, here's a decent listing, although there's more, this is not the newest screenshot, of the tools we already have pre-configured to work with GASP or any pipeline, because the Dockers are interchangeable. If you follow the spec, these will work. So if you are on write your own in, I don't know, language of your choice, these should all work for you as well. Oh, and the benefits of containerizing. Right? A lot of these tools, and let's be honest here, I'm gonna be frank, I've got a bunch of security people in the room, we kinda of suck at writing tools that are easy to install and deploy. So if you have one of those, you only have to do that interesting install once. Figure out how to make that crotchety sucker work in a Docker one time, and you're done, right? And now you can just keep using that Docker like it's a simple binary. Also, though, some of them have some pretty insane help or man pages and you only have to figure out the, the options that make sense maybe once, and you set those as the same defaults, and you, then you're also done, right? It's kind of nice. Tools can be in any language as long as it'll run in Docker, right? And now if you run that one tool with one profile against your suite of apps, you now have a way to look at all of your apps. And another interesting thing that I didn't even think about, you can kind of go meta with this. I've also used the same pipeline to run clock against all of my repos and understand what and how much source code I have. Clock is a tool to go measure how many lines of what source are in a repo, right? So do a checkout, run clock, and understand, oh, this is you know, 10,000 lines of Python and some CSS and some SAS and whatever else, right? It's actually quite handy, because now you're starting to understand all of these stinking apps that you're dealing with and all their repos. So there's also this idea of a named pipeline, both in the spec and in GASP. And the idea here is you take tool configs plus containers that's a pipeline tool, right? I have a config and I have a container that gives me a tool that I can run. And then I t stick multiple of those together. And in our lingo, we call that a named pipeline, right? So I can run git to pull out source code, run clock to figure out what's in there. Let's say it's Ruby, so I run Brakeman. And when I'm done, I shovel the results into Defect Dojo. 
And this is, well, <laughs> no fewer than one, because you need at least one tool to run, and arbitrarily long. It doesn't matter. You want to run 15 tools in a row, great. You have like seven tools to look at .NET, and you've got Dockers for them, you can run all seven. It doesn't matter. Here's an example of um, the, uh, oh, the thing went away, dang it. This is config.yaml, the sort of global config to define um, named pipelines. So this is just some global uh, settings that I think I have in the next slide. Yeah, an example of a named pipeline. So here is a named uh, source code named pipeline. If you look, we're gonna run, well, this is a little bit backwards. Startup happens first, then pipeline, then final. So at startup, we're going to run git, pull off a particular tag, and on fail, I'm just gonna stop, right? Because if it fails to pull the git repo, I don't need to run the other test. We're just gonna drop and move on. Um, if, if this all works, I'm gonna run clock and find out what I have and go back and run the pipeline. And then I can run check marks, bandit, check marks for kind of anything, bandit for Python, Brakeman for Ruby, and retire.js for JS, right? And when I'm done, I'm gonna take all the results of all of those tools, because they get dropped into a known location, slash opt appsec pipeline results, and shove those into Defect Dojo. So at the end of a run, what ends up happening is I have these findings that popped out of the tools in Defect Dojo, right? Run tool, results in Defect Dojo, done. But GASP is a command line tool because I don't do UI. You don't want me to do UI. It's really sad. Um, but I had Defect Dojo that looks awesome and works awesome, so I don't have to do a UI. I just shove stuff into there. And then if you want to, you could even do things like wire in Slack alerts. Um, so you can say, look, I'm running this pipeline. These are the tools that executed. This is what happened. I'm skipping Brakeman because maybe it isn't uh, Ruby. I'm skipping uh, Bandit because it isn't Python, right, and done. So it's up in, um, oh, this is, well, this is an old, oh, well, this is, yeah, this is, the library's up in AppSec pipeline slash GASP, and I think I have, yeah. The actual implementation of the GASP library is in GASP dash Docker, and that just shells out Docker, um, Docker commands, and runs all the tools locally. You can either have the results run in a data volume that is ephemeral, you know, that is created by Docker, a Docker data volume that gets launched, stuff gets written to it and it gets blown away at the end, or you can run them to the local disk. So if you already have source code on your laptop, you could just point it at wherever that source code it is and it runs. Ah, and this is Aaron's part, I, I don't see him, so I'm gonna be Aaron for a little bit. Um, this is what Aaron is doing with his implementation of the AppSec pipeline, he took the same spec, and the same dockers and he wrote something internally in Python. So he has this AppSec pipeline that's launching dockers, right, whatever they are. Um, he pushes things to Defect Dojo. Defect Dojo sends a summary to the Slack channel. When a developer um, checks in code, he has a webhook set up that'll let um, the AppSec pipeline know there's a new commit and then tools run. And he has uh, a mapping of what app gets which named uh, profile, or named pipeline, excuse me. So if app one fires, he knows I need to run Ruby tools, et cetera. If app two runs, oh, well, that's .NET, I'm gonna run these .NET tools. He has that mapped internally in his uh, AppSec pipeline. And then he has uh, Dojo wired into Jira to do, it's actually really sweet, Dojo does bi-directional um, mapping of the issues in Jira. So if you make a change to an issue in Dojo, it shows up in Jira. If you make a change to an issue in Jira, it shows up in Dojo, which is really pretty sweet. Um, it's lightweight, REST API. This is the one he's using for his tool. So if he wants to know what the integrations are, if it's dynamic or static, does he have a Git integration, what the integrations are, he can do all of his interactions with his tool over REST. So he can just run a curl command and magic happens, which is quite nice. He's using uh, one T2 large EC2 instance to run Dojo, I believe. I'm kind of, uh, this is in my deck, so don't quote me on that. Well, you can quote me, but it might be wrong. <laughs> um, you need tools that run fairly quickly, right? And this is also another choice you're gonna make in those named pipelines. Maybe you create one named pipeline that runs really fast and you can get this done. 
You have a second name pipeline that you run with less frequency and is non-blocking, and that guy runs once a week if it's like a long actual tool run. It's definitely lightweight. You can do differential scans now with some tools, or even looking at the diffs from GitHub if you want to wire it that way. Um, and he's also doing a whole bunch of stuff with third-party component checking, i.e. the, you know, are my libraries out of date stuff, right? That can all be wired in. You can use sync or uh, dependency check or any of those other, there's a whole bunch of .io guys that are doing that now. Um, his stats, he has 15 repos, he's had 5,100 runs over four months and 25,000 container executions because you just made an easy path to run these things. And it is like, it is stupid easy once you set this up to run them. So you can run them and go, oh, I don't like the results. Run them, change the profile and see if I get more or less results. Run them again, right? It just doesn't matter because they run, fire, clean up after themselves and done. It's really quite nice. I wonder why he put this slide in here. I have no idea why he put, oh, I think probably this. He recently added to Defect Dojo CI CD automation where you can actually wire in automation to Dojo to know how your CI CD is working and then based on when uh, like webhooks happen, the CI CD will run. So he knows that this build ID happened on this commit. It's in the master branch. Here's a, a link to the repo, et cetera. And all that's managed in Defect Dojo. He is, with, with his implementation, he's working on keeping all of the metadata to run the pipeline in Defect Dojo and just calling the Dojo API to pull that stuff up dynamically at runtime. So you change things here, and the next time you run the pipeline, it, it sees those changes and runs instead of keeping config in both places. Oh, well, I just talked through that, but he gave me a nice close-up. Um, yeah, I said all that stuff. Oh. And then he runs, Dojo has this idea of an engagement, and engagements have tests. And so an engagement is sort of a bucket to hold one or more tests. Each time he does a CI CD, he has sort of a special type of test called the CI CD test, and he writes the results into that test. So in this case, he ran a pipeline with burp and check marks in that uh, one pipeline, and then combined the results into one engagement, if that makes sense. A little bit of Dojo speak. So what has Aaron learned, or me? <laughs> or I'm Aaron right now, so what have I learned? Who knows? After the first run of the scans, net new vulnerabilities are low. And that's true, and I also find that about three runs, this is Matt speaking, not Aaron. Um, I also find that it takes about three good runs when I'm first running a tool to know what's going on and, and how to configure that profile, right? It takes two or three times to get a nice rock, rock solid profile that I can just run repeatedly. Um, legacy security tools, yes, are your biggest pain point, particularly trying to container them or write that shim for a container that knows how to talk out to them because most of these tools don't have APIs or they're really hard to automate. Um, evaluate what you did and look for it the next time for improvement. That's absolutely true. Like, and the other thing, since these run so fast and you can run them on a check-in basis, you can just run them every time something happens. And if you get no results, it's no big deal. Like, great. If you get a result, fine, I can act on that, right? And you can at least sort of keep a heartbeat on the security state of that application that you have automated. Oh, yes, and then the, the webhook tells you what's changed, right? You can let Git tell you what that last commit was and just act on that last commit if you have tools that are smart enough to understand that, right? And if there's an issue, you know that issue happened in that last commit because you're running this pipeline on every commit. So now the window of code that you have to look in to find what went south is that commit, not that code base, which is another huge advantage. Oh, you can manually review and tag files from a build, right? Uh, yes, you can actually say like, I wanna manually review this change to make sure this result is real that I just got running a pipeline with Defect Dojo and a pipeline. Uh, yeah. Oh, and this is the manual test creator for that result, and he, he pops a Slack alert to let them know that there's a manual review needed. So you can let your team know, hey, there's a manual or code needed for this thing that's in Defect Dojo. Go look at it and tell me what's wrong. And then you can obviously, if you have Diff or GitHub, um, you can look at the delta and understand what the changes are that happen. False positives, can we do better? Definitely. Um, there is a rules engine that just got added to Defect Dojo very recently, a week or two, I think. I don't remember how recently, but very recently. 
And the idea is when you're pulling in code, you can analyze it and write rules that say, if I run check marks and I get this issue, I want to automatically believe it. Or if I run this tool and I get this issue, bit bucket it, I know it's junk. And this can happen at import time so that you don't have these issues showing up as actual findings. So this is a way to sort of filter out the noise from running tools in a pipeline. And that just got added to Defect Dojo a week or so ago, which is super cool. Oh, yeah. You can use uh, CWE as one of the metrics that uh, Dojo uses. You can do things like match if the title says CWE, and I want to coerce it into this CWE. Like, because I don't like, there's like four or five different CWEs you might match for XSS, and I want it always to be 79. I can write this rule, and if there's XSS in the title of vulnerability, because every tool reports them in their unique little snowflakey way, I can get it done that way. You can do scanner matching, right? If I have SSL labs and I get a greater than A, I'm just gonna say it's verified. I'm not even gonna go back and manually check this, right? I'm just done, I'm happy. Um, you can take scanner confidence, right? If it's confirmed and the title is equals SSS, then update it to verified. And in Dojo speak, verified means I've looked at this result and I believe it to be true, as opposed to I just have a result. Ah, this. This is my slide, I know this slide. Right, the iceberg of ignorance. You should go look up this. I have references in the deck. It's a great little read. But there's this idea that the frontline troops really understand and see all the problems. And as you walk up the org, the visibility into those problems keeps going down. Right? And I'll wait for all the cameras to take pictures. <laughs> it's all good. Um, and I really, if you read this article, it's fantastic. And if you've lived in the front lines, you know this is really true. You know what's going on. And you talk to your boss, and you're like, OMG, he's so clueless. Because those bubbles, those, there's not a good way to bubble that information up and make those things visible. And my proposition is that with an AppSec pipeline, you can actually get that coverage and push that visibility north. Because now you can make accurate statements. I've, I know my life as an AppSec person is 10 plus years. I've had many times where I sort of have most of the apps that I kind of know about, but I know I'm going to find others, and I haven't had a chance to even look at half of them. And that wasn't a really great place when they're like, hey, how are we doing? I have no idea, right? I, we have some apps and some of those are good and I've never looked at others and there might be a basket case, they might be great, well, who knows, right? But now I can actually scan my whole suite and state, at least definitively of the ones I know, this is where we're at. And I can focus my efforts on the ones with the highest risk and the worst profile in terms of uh, vulnerabilities. Ah, and this, my favorite slide, this is all Aaron, although I love this slide so I've been putting it into my deck too, right? Uh, Finding Nemo, right, the shark, we all remember this. If you have kids, you've seen this many times. If you don't, you should still see it because it's cool. Right, the shark, if you remember, had that nice mantra, Bruce, Chum, and Anchor. I'm a nice shark, not a mindless eating machine. My pointer, why is my pointer there? Go away, pointer. That's bothering me. If I am to change this image, I must first change myself. Fish are friends, not food, right? And they were trying to change their life. Well, I would say what we need in AppSec is I'm a nice security professional, not a mindless vulnerability spewing machine. If I am to change this image, I must first change myself. Developers are friends, not fools. <laughs> and that is <laughs> absolutely dead true. Yes. So if you want to, uh, we have, an app, we have a, a Twitter handle and a hashtag that we've trademarked. We haven't really trademarked it. Please, be with Bruce. And that's it. Questions, if you have them, I have what, five minutes left? <laughs> yes, sir. Can you recommend a tool or a solution to check a code signature in the first Ooh, like a, like, a, like, a, like a signed code body? Yeah, every git commit is signed. And, and uh, ah. if I do, I will check and verify and we check if it's not signed. Yeah, I don't know of one that I wouldn't have written. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know of a can tool that you can just go by, to be honest with you. You could probably knock that out in the language of your choice if you're decently good on, on language, but I don't know of one that I can tell you off the bat. Yes? Uh, I, I don't know uh, Defect Dojo, so maybe you have a good share. Do you keep a history of those certain uh, data and what the results were? Ah, I'll repeat it. Uh, you asked about Defect Dojo and does it keep a history of builds and what was there, right? Y yes, and I, I, I then also want to follow that up with, um, do you, can, you, can you trace those builds back to tags in your repo if, if you want to go back, if, if you, you want to roll it, back the... 
You, you yes, if you wanted to set it, if you set it up that way and you had that infrastructure in place, you're tagging things accurately and sanely, and yes, Defect Dojo will do that. It, will, it, will, it can, for an engagement, understand what tag it tested, and you would obviously know, like, tag minus one is the next tag, and go. Yeah. But, but it also sets the tag. Dojo doesn't set the tag, it reads the tag of the commit. Does that make sense? Like, it takes that information from Git and knows what tag it's reviewing. It doesn't set the tag. Okay, but wouldn't you run a tag over the whole repo? You, you could certainly configure it that way. I don't know how Aaron did it. We didn't set tags where I worked last. Um, Aaron might be doing that. Um, I don't know. But it, you could, it certainly has the capacity to track that for you, to know this vulnerability came with that tag, and the previous one didn't have it, so we could, like you said, roll back if you wanted to, yes. Because it, it keeps that metadata with each uh, engagement or scan. So you could just look at the previous scan, they're dated, they're sorted, right? Scan minus one was, didn't have it scanned, you know, scan zero did, fine, I'll go to scan minus one and that's a tag I know I can rely on. Does that help? Yes? Uh, can you repeat what is engagement? I'm sorry? Yeah, what, can you re-elaborate what is engagement? Ah, engagement is honestly just a bucket to hold one or more testing activities. And this started at Rackspace when we originally created something that was very much like Dojo. And the idea was, I'm gonna interact with this application, I'm gonna do one or more things. I might do a threat model and look at their API and run a static tool against them. And I wanted a way to group those together, and that's what an engagement does. It takes multiple security activities and rolls them into one thing so you can track it. Because it's sort of like, I got the request to review app A, and in that request to review app A, I ran these four tools, and that's all held in an engagement. Okay. That makes sense? And, yeah, and uh, uh, you initially said that uh, AppSec pipeline is, for, uh, is made by AppSec team and for AppSec team. Yep. And uh, how are you supposed to uh, communicate with actual DevOps team? Ah. To build this CI and CD. Yeah, if you, if you wire into Defect Dojo, then you can take those results and send them off to the bug tracker that you use, right? That's usually how you interact with dev teams or DevOps teams, right? They have a bug tracker of some sort. I would take those findings and the ones that I want addressed, I would put them into a bug yeah, tracker. Yeah, yeah, but my question was, uh, uh, there are applications that require uh, complex configuring for, uh, and complex deployment, et cetera. So, uh, AppSec team, have to take the results of uh, those deployments from, uh, from DevOps, mm -hmm. or how, how are you supposed to uh, deploy and configure applications for dyna Dynamics scans, for example? Oh, so you're saying that, like in a case where you have, like say, Ansible to use your deploy and you have a configuration for Ansible and you know that yeah, that was the Ansible sure. that was used to deploy the thing that you scanned? I don't know if it has that level of metadata yet in, I mean, there's tagging you could do inside of Defect Dojo to track that, but you'd have to sort of do that as a, a one-off tag, it doesn't have a native way to track the configuration of the infrastructure that you tested. Yes. So it's doable as a tag, but not native, if that makes sense. Okay. Oh, blinding uh, light. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. All, all making like a lot of sense. <laughs> so, hey, I, I make sense, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that, that's really good. So the <laughs> question is, um, we have this orchestration like thing going on now, right? Kubernetes, that's that's the big word. Yep. And in our company, we use Kubernetes to run all the things. Mm -hmm. And recently, we tried to deploy parts of the AppSec pipeline, or at least the Defect Dojo, and found out that it's a bit painful because it uses Docker Compose, which does not translate di directly to Kubernetes stuff. Yep. And the question is, can you run AppSec pipeline on top of Kubernetes or something like this? Or have you thought about that? Yeah, thank you. I've thought about it. I've never done it. Um, you sure should be able to do that. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because you'd have to turn that compose into the YAML that, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, unfortunately, that's probably the best answer I can give you right now. I don't have a, a Kubernetes environment that I'm playing with currently at, at current jobs, so I've nev not done that. But you should be able to do that. You're just going to have to take the compose language to glue yeah, those bits yeah. together and or maybe just run the whole AppSec pipeline in one another container and do like little inception situation there. So, but yeah, yeah okay, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, and when I ran it last, I had a separate, um, I was doing all this in EC2, EC2 instances, or, or not EC2, uh, yeah, EC2, the container service. They were running my Dockers, mm -hmm. um, and I had a separate, just a normal um, VM running Dojo. Okay, thank and you. And then the RDS running the database. Yeah, cool, yeah. thank you. Yep. One more question. You're gonna have to argue with who gets that, and then I'll talk to you afterwards, I'll go out in the hall. Anybody wants to ask me a question, I'll answer it. He's got the mic, I'm sorry. I, I'll get yours afterwards, I promise. I'll be out in the hall. 
you, do you have any ability in the tool to do uh, matching of results to do new versus old or find ah, versus fix? That's in, not in my tool, but in Defect Dojo, I got to do a little bit of a dance. Um, Defect Dojo has deduping, and if they appear or reappear, all of that's in there. Oh, come on up. This is Aaron. I no longer have to be two people. This is great. Thank you, Tube. Um, one more question? Okay, yes. Okay, as a developer, I was, I, this looks great, but I was a little uncomfortable with the sort of parallelness of it that's ah. going on. Do you have any comments about how you actually sort of bring the little fishes to be sharks themselves? Yeah, yeah. Uh, about the parallelness in particular, um, and this all was mostly inspired by a prior employer, um, the AppSec team itself was very dysfunctional. And I didn't feel like if we couldn't function well, going out and telling the dev teams what to do felt like a really bad play. So I wanted to get us humming along and confident in how we did our work and then reach out. And so that's why I say it's an AppSec pr pr tool for AppSec people. And it's not, it, honestly, that's sort of a bit of a, a m m poorly worded. Um, because really it is for the devs eventually to get the stuff fixed. But it was really to get your own house in order because if you're a mess and you're trying to help somebody else, that's a mess. So I'd much rather have, that's why I say it's internal, like get yourself really humming away good and then go reach out to devs and find out how you can integrate them into you. Does that, does that help explain the reason for the parallel? Awesome. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, I would like to ask you kindly to vote for the talk if you like. In your exit you will find some red and green cards. And don't forget to go to skate.org for your voting again, for your uh, critique. And thank you very much. Thanks.